Well, hey, everybody, thank you so much for clicking and, and watching this video. Um, my name is Mary Coughlin. I'm a neonatal nurse practitioner by training and the president and founder of Caring Essentials Collaborative, an organization committed to transforming the heart and soul of healthcare around the world through the adoption of a trauma-informed paradigm. And if you've been following my series, this particular series, I am taking folks through um, my book, the second edition of Transformative Nursing in the NICU. And today's session is going to wrap up chapter five entitled The Soul of Trauma-Informed Care, part three. And so um, prior to today's session. I talked about um, caring science, looking at the work of Jean Watson and her 10 caritas processes. Then we discussed a little bit about um, this idea of quantum physics, quantum caring, and consciousness. And um, I hope you found some of the papers that I included, the citations I included um, in the description part of the video, interesting, intriguing, and really wanting to make you um, explore more. After that recording, I had thoughts of maybe directing you to some of the work of um, Alan Watts, who was a kind of a philosopher, mystic um, back in the 70s, who really has done some really interesting work, um, helping you kind of open up and understand that, that sense of consciousness. And today, um, the session is titled Spirituality and Quality Caring. And this will close out chapter five. And so I actually pulled up um, one of the key papers that I used as a resource for this chapter, and I'll share that with you shortly. But if you remember, when we talked about the quantum physics, um, one of the quotes from the book was that consciousness defines our existence. And picking up on that same idea, I open up this, past, this last um, section of chapter five with the idea, and this is actually extracted from uh, the work of Hawthorne and Gordon, if consciousness defines our existence, then spirituality is the essence, giving meaning and purpose to life. And it's clear um, you know, in the work that I've been doing, but maybe less clear to some folks that spirituality is not the same thing as religiosity, but they absolutely do intersect. There are very religious people who are deeply spiritual and there are deeply spiritual people who are not religious, right? So it's, it's important to kind of understand the nuance between um, the terminology, because I think a lot of folks go to that place, you know, that somebody's gonna start trying to convert them or something like that. And that's not the case at all when we're talking about spirituality, but that spiritual needs are a quintessential aspect of the lived human experience, whether that spiritual need is um, grounded in agnosticism or atheism, or whether it's a more traditional religious-based type of um, spiritual, spiritual practice. It's important that we really evaluate and understand what the patient and the family's spiritual needs are, because again, that's such a, a a, a critical element of their capacity to cope, um, you know, cultivate hope um, and, and a, a place of comfort for many families, particularly during a crisis situation. The benefits of providing spiritual nursing care impact both the nurse and the patient, because when we have the courage to like lean in and, and ask those questions that may feel very uncomfortable for us, um, it brings us closer in our relationship and what we know just from it being a human being, but also in the, in the, in the science that it's relationships that really um, cultivate that sense of being seen and can actually transfer healing energy, healing dynamics within our physiology when we feel seen and when we feel that we are helping others, right? When I, when I look at it from the nurse or the clinician side of it, supporting individuals' spiritual needs helps me. I mean, it because it, it makes me feel like I'm really fully serving this individual in crisis. You know, I can do the medical stuff. I can do the nursing stuff. I can do all of that kind of stuff. But how am I helping them cope through the human, through the lived experience of this? And spirituality is oftentimes um, one of those... Um, 
strategies, if you will, that can really have profound impact, but oftentimes we don't um, tap into it. Um, when I, again, looking through the research, there was some really cool stuff specific to the NICU with regards to um, the spiritual needs. And this was a paper by Alamdar et al, 2018, um, as reported earlier, providing spiritual care interventions to mothers in the NICU statistically reduced maternal stress, stress levels. However, in another study um, done by Mamier et al and published in 2019, um, the prevalence and correlates of providing spiritual care, NICU nurses were the least likely to provide spiritual care interventions when compared to their pediatric and adult nursing counterparts. And I think that's an opportunity for us to really kind of unbundle, why is that? Um, I, I mean, I can tell you from my own experience why that is, is because I had this sense through my acculturation into nursing at large and neonatal nursing um, in particular, that we didn't talk about those things, that that's, that's personal, that's not part of your job. Your job is here is to, you know, manage the, um, the disease aspects of their um, hospitalization, and that's it, you know, and in fact, that's not the case, you know, as I'm, I'm sure you're kind of hopefully taking away um, from this work by now, is that according to Florence Nightingale, we manage the human experience of disease and the disease um, details, right? The symptoms and the medications and the interventions and stuff. That's one aspect of the human experience of disease. It's multifaceted. And so we need to kind of um, work through how we are going to lean into meeting those spiritual needs. And it is, um, I, th I think personally, and I, I, there is research to support this, that it really requires us to reconnect and revisit, well, what are my spiritual needs? Where do I stand in this? And there are, there are great clinicians out there that are very grounded in their spirituality. And, um, and it just comes very natural to them to support um, families and, and individuals in that way. And I, I am in awe and I admire them hugely. For me, I'm less on solid ground. I mean, I'm getting there, you know, with my spirituality and I am more comfortable now than I was, you know, 20 years ago, 25 more years ago, maybe, um, in, you know, knowing where I was or where I am in my own spiritual needs, because that's what grounds us to then, if this helps me, how can I help other? And it's more than saying, do you want me to get a chaplain? I mean, that I'm not saying that asking that question isn't helpful, but it's more than that. Because sometimes I would say that mostly just to pass the buck because I felt really uncomfortable right now. And I'm just going to have somebody else who I, you know knows what they're doing. Cause I didn't feel like I knew what I was doing. I felt like there were things that I needed to be like checked off on before I could really be responsive to someone's spiritual needs. But in my own growth and evolution, I now realize that no, no, it's embracing our shared humanity that helps me connect with and, and be curious, right? Be curious about what are your spiritual needs? Do you, are there anything? Are there routines and rituals in your family that might help bring you a sense of comfort, a sense of security, a sense of stability in this incredibly chaotic experience? Is it a naming ceremony? Is it a baptism? Is it just having family come together? And I know that these are challenging times where families are, are really limited and almost being well, patients are almost being held hostage by the healthcare systems. Um, and I understand what's happening, um, but I absolutely believe there is a better way. And, um, and so on the outside, it may look like we're just escalating the trauma because of our inability to lean into that human experience. And that can actually translate into looking like being inhumane. Um, Unfortunately, investigations into spirituality in the NICU setting are limited, and, um, but we need to figure out how we can 
overcome that, you know, and certainly research and investigation from that perspective is a, is a good first start um, to get more information out there to really explore what what are the spiritual needs of individuals in crisis and how can we bring spiritual nursing care practices into our care plan seamlessly, integratedly, um, compassionately, authentically. So um, I'm, I just pulled up the Hawthorne paper, Hawthorne and Gordon, the, type, the title of the paper, and this was published in 2020, the Journal of Holistic Nursing, the invisibility of spiritual nursing care in clinical practice. This is not um, looking at it within any specific specialty as a general um, paper, um, but of course, you know, kind of positioned through the lens of a holistic nursing approach. And, um, and they absolutely recommend that holistic nursing includes assessing and responding to the spiritual needs of uh, the patient. Um, I'm just gonna scroll down here. They, it's a really great paper and I will pop it into the description because it's also open access, which may be really helpful for you guys. Um, why is spiritual care important? And it just talks about, you know, that, that feeling of being cared for is mediated by that existential, um, an existential component that may find itself kind of embedded in our own metaphysics, you know, our own spiritual beliefs, our own awareness of our shared humanity and, um, and connectedness. Many patients receiving spiritual care interventions actually say that it's very comforting. It, it brings peace to them. They feel like seen, cared for in a, you know, beyond the symptom kind of a, a perspective. And so this, I think, is a really important tool, right, to add to our toolkit, but it has to be added and embraced authentically, not just like, oh, I heard that this might be helpful for you. I'm going to check that over to you. Um, none of that works, right, when we approach the care of others in that way. And so I thought that you might find that interesting. And in um, one of the papers, or actually it was a I kind of extrapolated this um, list of perceived barriers to providing spiritual care from um, many of the papers. I'm just making sure that I'm not misrepresenting. Yes, so this list that I'm gonna share with you is, is extracted from the readings of Hawthorne and Gordon 2019, well, actually 2020. It was a, a pre-pub that when I referenced it, Mamier et al. 2019 and Riahi et al. 2018. And these perceived barriers uh, that nurses are articulating is a, a lack of education, um, time constraints. It's a low priority. And I understand that, you know, especially when you're working in an intensive care environment, you may feel like this stuff is the fluff. This is the stuff I just don't have time to, but if I do, I'll get to it when I can. But what we know from the work of, um, let's see, it's Tubbs Cooley um, and her co-authors and, oh dear me, um, a couple of authors, why are they escaping me from Canada that talked about this idea of missed care or rationed care. And, um, and I, these authors were looking at it within the NICU framework. And I apologize that I can't remember the other um, paper authors, but I will include them in the description below this idea of missed care. If you recognize it from a professional nursing perspective that this is absolutely nursing care, but it falls to the bottom of your priority list, it's still missed care. It's care that would have impacted the patient in a positive way, but you weren't able to get to it. And there's a myriad of factors for that, but, and I digress a little bit, but it's important that we don't diminish the, the relevance of this care just because it's low on our priority list. It's still important. There's still evidence to support that it will have a favorable impact on the patient. And spiritual care does have a favorable impact on your patient. Um, another perceived barrier that I think you might find really interesting that was articulated was confusion about the boundaries. It, is it okay for me to talk about this? Am I crossing a line? And again, that speaks to just kind of the general dismissiveness and maybe even taboo nature of spirituality within a healthcare setting. Um, I think hospital, and this is me just kind of spitballing, but I think hospitals that have a very clear religious affiliation, there may not be as much confusion but in um, you know, hospitals that don't have a religious affiliation, there may be that confusion. And it, and it may be um, you know, kind of like that separation of church and state, you know, like, oh, is this a separation between church and, um, and business, the business of healthcare? 
but it's not the business of healthcare. It's the business of caring for humans. And so is it really, um, should it really be um, separated? And I, I think the, what the research is telling us is no. Um, so this is the one that I mentioned earlier, belief that spirituality is a private topic, so I shouldn't be talking about it. Staffing deficits. I don't have time to get into this. Cultural differences. Well, I might be... Um, Roman Catholic, and they're Jewish, or they're Muslim, or they're something else. So I don't really know how to talk about this. And if you think about it really, in a quiet moment, is that really the issue? Or is it are we using those as excuses to not, you know, kind of transcend this um, perceived separateness, when really there isn't a separation, but, you know, we're, we're, confused, we're, we're, we're insecure. And so that's why I think, just like all of this information that I'm sharing with you, it really begins with a deep dive within ourselves, unbundling our own stories about spirituality. And is it personal? And yeah, it's personal, it's private. But what could be more private than me being in this critical situation where I'm in a life and death situation? That's a pretty personal and private lived experience that there's like 30 plus odd people bearing witness to it. The intimacy is kind of gone from that. And I need help, particularly when I'm in a super vulnerable situation. Workload, again, you know, kind of different language for a very similar theme. I don't have enough time. Lack of management support. So, you know, once you kind of work through what your own feelings are and your own beliefs and where you're you know, gonna feel grounded. I'm, I'm looking at the floor, right? Where you're gonna feel grounded with your own spirituality. And then that gives you that um, foundation to then spring off of. Um, if you're still on, on insta instable ground, you may also feel like if I do this, I'm gonna be judged by others. You know, I might get called into the office or get spoken to. So once you get that level of grounding and you pull the research and you really kind of you know share this with your team, this needs to be a critical part of the care that we offer families in crisis. Not one uh, denomination, one you know one aspect of it, but just opening up to what meeting people's spiritual needs. And then the final barrier is a lack of awareness that there is even a thing, you know, called spiritual needs. And what the research helps us understand is that indeed there is life threatening illness and the associated bearing witness to the family in crisis, often accompanied by contemplation of fundamental spiritual and existential questions for healthcare providers. And we need to really work through them. I think initially as, a, as an individual, but ideally as a team, how are we gonna to come together? Um, and I think it's almost like a safe playground, if you will, to have those open discussions with your colleagues because that sets the stage for the diversity of spiritual needs that you will encounter when serving your patients and families. And I know if you're right now in the throes of you know, COVID and you're thinking, Mary, we don't have enough staff and those are our priorities, I understand. I really do, I understand. But please don't just dismiss this out of hand. This is a relevant and vital part of quality care, quality service to others that unfortunately now in the situation we are, we are in as we watch our healthcare system implode because it is not built on a solid foundation, you know, think about these things, right? I'm not saying do this now, but I'm thinking, I'm hoping that this is, I'm planting seeds that will eventually germinate beginning within you, within your heart, and really start to understand that this is really important, that this system is, is failing. It's failing my patients clearly, and it's failing me because if it fails me, it will naturally fail the patients. That's just the way it will roll. And, um, and to really understand that. And then take, to take those steps back and re-examine what will the new healthcare look like? Will the new healthcare really be care that promotes health? Or it will, will it be, it, I mean, it can't be. It can't be a continuation of what we're offering now. We offer sick care. You know, we don't offer health care. Um, and so really just thinking about these things, right, within your own exist existential journey and self-discovery. Um, let's see, um, in one other paper that I reference here that um, uh, Brelsford et al. 2016 found that NICU parents' religious and spiritual beliefs affected their coping capacity 
and their family cohesion. So, and, and the thing of it is, is when you're in the throes of trauma and crisis, you've, you're lost, right? You're lost. And it's really hard to find your way back to that, um, that support network that you have. Cause you're just, you're fight or flight. You're like, ah, you know, I'm losing it. And so that's why it's important for us to help remind them, re-equilibrate, re-embrace them. If you remember, I hope I talked about this in the science um, section, but the work of Bruce Perry, right? He talks about in his neurosequential model, regulate, relate, and reason. And that goes the same with any kind of care that we're providing. These are not distinct aspects. These are integrated aspects of a holistic approach to caring to individuals that are in tr crisis, that are experiencing trauma. And so when people are like that, it, you know, understanding that spiritual needs are a critical component of, you know, coping with the with trauma, with the crisis, and a critical aspect of human life in itself. You get to be that person that helps restore them. It, you know, do you have any spiritual practices or routines or rituals that help give you that sense of balance, that give you that sense of comfort and safety and peace? What are they? Let's help you get reconnected with that as you embark on this journey that's going to be very distressing. It's going to be, and it's going to be long. And so we need to help them find their foundations, find their um what do you call them? They're, they're life preservers as they go through the rapids of this um, very distressing and um, life-threatening experience. So, and, and actually um, this paper went on to talk about parents with negative spiritual um, coping described as feelings of abandonment or anger with a higher power tended to experience higher levels of denial and lower levels of feeling connected to their family versus parents who utilize positive religious coping. Um, also use negative religious coping while in the NICU, which speaks to the multi-layer, multi-level aspects of stress and processing grief. And I'm going to just kind of pull you back to what I had mentioned um, the other day about you know, Newman's theory of health is expanding consciousness, that we need to help these families find their footing in the throes of crisis and, and readapt, right? It's that, you know, um, the stress response, right? You're in a place of homeostasis and then you get hit with a stressor, allostasis. The stressor is that you're in this crisis. You have to figure out how to return back to homeostasis and meeting spiritual needs is one mechanism of, you know, of, of re, um, reattaining that, that sense of homeostasis. It can be short-lived and it may, if you're in the NICU or any kind of an intensive care setting, those, those periods will be short-lived, but at least it's a little oasis that you can retreat to as you are moving through the crisis. And that's why these are really important needs that need to be met. And for me, you know, the kind of the other part of this, um, the heading of this subsection of the chapter is talking about quality caring. That's what it is, right? Quality caring is is meeting the whole person needs, right? The whole family needs, the whole dyad needs. It's not just symptom management because as frustrating as you think that is, that's the easy part. The challenging part is meeting all of these other aspects of care. But I actually just recently, and I need to dive into the biology of this, right? I had this amazing conversation earlier today with Dr. Heather Forkey. She is the lead author on the clinical report from the American Academy of Pediatrics looking at trauma-informed care with pediatrics. And she was sharing with me this talk that she's gonna be doing at the Chadwick conference that I think you, sh you all should check out. I'm definitely gonna check it out. But she was talking about the biology, how the brain changes in the setting of trauma to the caregiver, to the parent. So I'm like all over what, you know, what the trauma experience is doing to the baby's brain. And she's sharing with me how um, all of this trauma that's happening during this perinatal postnatal crisis, the trauma mechanisms actually gum up the works of the caregiving biology. So they're less capable of attuning to the baby. So it's really important that we figure out how we can support the family during these acute um, periods of trauma so that we don't gum up their capacity to be that optimal caregiver, that optimal parent attuning to their baby in crisis. And we don't do this well. 
we, you know this, we don't do this well. And, you know, meeting spiritual needs is one tool in the toolbox that you can use to help the parents or the family find the resource they need that will restore a level of comfort, maybe not necessarily control, but some peace. And, you know, on the journey to the peace, there may be anger, there may be all of these things. And for us as loving, compassionate caregivers, understanding what's happening to these individuals from a lived human experience, right? From an existential perspective, from even their spiritual dimensions, for understanding that and saying their anger, even though they might be yelling at me, it's not because of me, it's their experience. And we have to honor that and not be affected. And I know that's wicked hard. And that's why I think on this journey of becoming a trauma-informed professional, it really requires us to do our own internal work. You know, it hurts when somebody's yelling in your face, when they're saying hurtful things, you know, that you're maybe not doing a good job and that you're hurting their baby and you don't know who you are and all that kind of stuff. It does hurt. But we have to be grounded in our knowing that their expressions are not a reflection of us. They're a reflection of their themselves. And that I've learned through my own spiritual journey, that whatever anyone else is expressing into the world, it's theirs. I don't own it. But too often we pick it up and we miss the opportunity to really recognize, sorry, I don't know. I had to shut my phone up. Um, recognize the opportunity that we have to transcend that, that distress, that ego-driven experience. And I understand you're really upset. I understand you're terrified. How can I help you? What will soothe you? We have some spiritual resources here. I can sit down and talk with you. What kind of routines do you do when you're in, in, in other types of um, stressful situations? What will help you? And that doesn't, doesn't necessarily guarantee that you're going to get a nice, kind response either. But if you can reflect back to them, love, compassion, kindness, empathy, patience, then that will, it gradually, it will penetrate. It will penetrate them and help them, help them help themselves through you, guiding them. Addressing spirituality and spiritual needs in the NICU for the infant, the family, and the staff is critical. However, this key domain of the human experience is often overlooked, and I kind of gave you those barriers and provided some additional resources here. The spiritual well-being and spiritual intelligence of nurses, and I actually, I just, I hadn't heard about this term, you know, before, and um, just recently, actually, it came back to my reading, this idea of spiritual intelligence. So I just bought a book and um, I'll follow up with you and let you know what, what I think about it. But I love that, you know, that we can cultivate, we, you know, intellectual, um, our IQ, our intellectual quotient, um, our intellectual intelligence, emotional intelligence, spiritual intelligence is also really important. And it does have a beneficial effect. Um, spirituality is a unique aspect of the human experience that is capable of transforming trauma from a place of isolation, fear, and despair to one of connectedness, courage, and joy. I wrote those words. And it's true. And I could feel, you know, my heart opening as I said that. And so um, I'm going to share some of these resources with you guys. Um, hopefully I remember what I said I was going to share with you. And, but I also want you to write back to me, okay? Um, I want us to have this dialogue. I want to encourage you to go on your own journey, unbundle and discover, rediscover. Where's your spirituality at? It may be religious. It may not be. It, and it's all good. You just have to find where your um, foundation is. Because that, I think, for, at least for me, is what gave me the security, that feels like the right word, and the courage to then lean into the discomfort of having this discussion with individuals who are in crisis because they cannot see. They cannot see the forest through the trees because of the crisis that they are in right now in that given moment. And it doesn't matter what you think of it. It doesn't matter if it's not a big deal. This will pass. 
and they'll, they'll feel silly. They won't feel silly because it will always be a trauma memory for them. And you can help be that bomb that helps ease that fear, that, that isolation, that terror, and be restored to a place of hope and a place of comfort and feeling a connection with at the very least you and possibly your team. So thank you so very much. I hope you found this interesting and um, I'll be now taking the weekend off. I apologize that I missed posting yesterday. Um, we're up in Maine, just taking a little bit of a um, mental health break and I will be back um, with you on Monday introducing the core measures section of the, um, of the book. Let me just see what I've titled that so section for you. Core measures, <laughs> core measures for trauma-informed care. And this is a very, um, updated view and examination and utilization of this idea of the core measures for trauma-informed developmentally supportive care that I think you're going to find really intriguing and hopefully practical um, and maybe even eye-opening. So thank you so very much. You guys take care and care well. Bye.